I'm custom painting and super detailing an in-scale locomotive on Ron's Trains and Things right now. Hi, I'm Ron of Ron's Trains and Things, and if you'd like to see more model railroad tips, tools, and techniques, then be sure and subscribe down below and click that little bell icon so you can catch future videos. Those of you who have watched my videos over time know that I've talked quite a bit about the fact that often structures and details that we need for our model railroad layouts are not available. This brings us to the need to either kit bash or scratch build many of the things that we need for our layouts. This is especially true if you're trying to be true to a prototype, and it also is especially true if you model in N scale or other less common scales that don't have as much commercially available. Well, as much as this is true about structures and detail parts, it's also true about locomotives and rolling stock. Sometimes we need a particular locomotive or a locomotive for a particular railroad that just is not commercially available. This leaves us with the option of either settling for something less than what we want, or somehow customizing a locomotive or some rolling stock to make what we really need. Well, that's exactly what I'm going to do today. I'm going to show you how I custom painted and detailed a locomotive in order to represent a locomotive for a particular short line that didn't have any locomotives commercially available and in scale. This was the first time I had done this kind of customization to this level on a locomotive, and I'm really pleased with how it came out. I hope that as you watch, you'll use my experience as an encouragement to yourself, maybe to try your hand at customizing some rolling stock or even a locomotive. So let me show you how I custom painted and detailed the Fort Worth and Western number 2003. One design element on my layout is an interchange between BNSF and the Fort Worth and Western Railroad at Hodge Junction in North Fort Worth, Texas. I thought it would add a lot of visual and operational interest to model one of Fort Worth and Western's locomotives to work the area. Since no commercial model of a Fort Worth and Western locomotive has ever been produced in N scale, I knew this would be a fully custom job. Having lived in the area for six years, I'm fairly familiar with the Fort Worth and Western's locomotive fleet. It is made up primarily of second-hand four-axle locomotives. The choice as to which locomotive to model began with decals. No decals for the Fort Worth and Western were commercially available in N-scale either, but I have a friend, Doug, who was interested in doing a similar project and was able to commission some very nice decals from Highball Graphics, which he split with me. Highball had produced Fort Worth and Western decals in HO, but not in N-scale, although I believe these decals may be available from their website now. The decals I received were for four locomotives in the 2000 through 2005 series, which were old GP35s that Fort Worth and Western rebuilt and upgraded their electronics and designated them GP38-3s. Doing some research on the internet, I was able to find significant information about locomotive number 2003, so I chose that model as the locomotive to model. This locomotive was built by EMD in June of 1965 for the Southern Pacific. It was originally number 7753, but the next year was renumbered to number 6650. It was a Phase 1B locomotive with a turbocharger and dynamic brakes. In a subsequent rebuild, the turbocharger was removed and a paper air filter housing installed along the front of the dynamic brake blister, one of the key identifying features of this particular locomotive. I began the project with an Atlas undecorated version of the GP35. At the time I purchased this locomotive, a Phase 1B with dynamic brakes was not available in an undecorated version, although I have found decorated ones after the fact. The key identifier between the Phase 1A and 1B is that the 1B has seven panel latches along its long hood, while the 1A has only three latches. This left me with a choice between having too few panel latches but having dynamic brakes, or having the right number of panel latches with no dynamic brakes. As the dynamic brake blister is such an obvious feature, and the way it is modified is key to this particular locomotive's look, I chose to go with the Phase 1A locomotive with the dynamic brakes. Since I was customizing this locomotive, I decided that I would super detail it to a level which I do not do with most of my locomotives. 
After gathering all of my detail parts, I began by disassembling the locomotive completely. This locomotive had originally been equipped with a gyro light in the top of the nose. A recess remains on the locomotive where the gyro light once was. I carefully cut out the recess where the gyro light would have been with a hobby knife. I used a razor saw to cut away the turbo housing from the front of the dynamic brake blister, and I carefully filed and sanded both of these openings. I used a number 17 chisel blade to remove the molded on class lights and grab irons. I removed the molded in fans by drilling holes around the perimeter of the fans just inside the housing. It was necessary for the housing to remain intact as only the grills would be replaced. I then used a hobby knife to cut out the fans between the holes and shaped and smoothed the inside of the fan housings with a round file and sandpaper. The horn needed to be relocated, so I filled the hole where the horn had originally been located with styrene rod and sanded it smooth. Number 2003 has no rear number boards, so I similarly filled the rear number board openings with 40,000 styrene, filling the seams with gap filling CA and sanding them smooth. I used scraps of styrene to fill in the recess in the nose from the gyro light, filling the seams with putty. I built the paper air filter housing from 20,000 styrene and installed it using solvent cement. I installed a BLMA snowplow on the front pilot. This is a white metal part, so I attached it with CA. I also installed front and rear cut levers and MU hoses from Trainworks and train line hoses from BLMA, all of which were attached with CA. Moving to the roof, I installed the 36 inch and 48 inch BLMA fans where I had removed the molded in fan detail. I painted the fan blades white to help the detail stand out. I removed the molded on lift ring detail and installed BLMA lift rings and holes drilled with an 80,000 drill bit. These are easily the smallest detail parts I have ever worked with and are honestly barely visible. 2003 has only one sunshade on the conductor side, so I installed one from Trainworks. I installed a firecracker antenna from Miniatures by Eric on the cab roof. Number 2003 has a second antenna on the roof that I believe is for an end of train device communication, but nothing like this is available commercially and it proved too small to fabricate, so I left it off. I installed BLMA wire grab irons to the front and rear, as well as the curved grab on the rear rooftop that wraps around the back of the radiator fan. I used the BLMA drilling template, which is an invaluable tool for getting the grab irons on the rear positioned correctly. I carved off the molded on MU stand on the front conductor side and installed the two separate MU stands from Miniatures by Eric. Also from the same supplier, I installed a sand hatch cover on the conductor side of the top of the short hood, as is in prototype photos. These locomotives have a rather unique and distinctive spark deflectors. I couldn't find anything like it, nor was I successful in my attempts to fabricate one from scratch, so I contacted a designer on Shapeways.com who was producing spark arresters with a similar shape. After exchanging a few emails and photos, he was able to design exactly what I needed. As these are printed in FUD plastic, I had to prime them with a primer for polycarbonate plastic. Then I installed them. I reinstalled the horn on the conductor side at the rear of the dynamic brake blister per prototype photos. I primed the entire model with Tamiya surface primer for plastic and metal in a gray color. For painting the model, I found that True Color produced solvent-based paints in Fort Worth and Western Blue and Fort Worth and Western Yellow. Personally, I prefer to work with acrylics, but I couldn't pass up these perfect matches for my model. I painted the entire model with the True Color Blue, and after it had had plenty of time to cure, I masked off for the yellow portions of the locomotive. I sealed the masking tape with another light coat of blue, and when this was dry, I painted the yellow and then removed the masking tape as quickly as possible so as not to allow it to stick too hard and peel off the blue paint. I was extremely happy with the paint job at this point. I hand painted the grab irons, cut levers, safety handrails, and other details using the Fort Worth and Western yellow. I gloss coated the shell in preparation for decaling. 
I applied the decals to the body sides using Microscale's Microset and Microsol. The decal set included safety stripes for the side sills. The chevrons on the nose of the locomotive were a special challenge as they had to be threaded under the wire grab irons. With the paint and decals done, I could install the final details. I installed a trainworks mirror on the engineer's side only per my reference photos. As I began to reassemble the shell, I installed windshield wipers also from Trainworks. I painted the MU and train line hoses an oily black and the spark deflectors a flat black. I replaced the light board in the locomotive with a sound decoder. I wanted to try an MRC sound decoder. I had seen a number of reviews that complained that MRC's decoders did not put out enough volume but the ease of installation of decoders with speakers built right into the board convinced me to try one for myself. Installation was a breeze, but I quickly found that the reviews were right. Even with the fans bored out and open fans installed, the MRC decoder volume is very low. Even at full volume, it produced less sound than I would prefer. With the locomotive reassembled, I took it out for a test run. Let's have a look and a listen to see how she runs. I'm very happy with how this custom painting and detailing job came out on Fort Worth and Western number 2003. In a future video, I'll show you how I weathered this locomotive and get her ready for interchange service at Haas Junction. This custom locomotive didn't come out absolutely perfect, but it did come out as a very nice representation of the Fort Worth and Western's 2003, and I'm very pleased with how the details and especially the custom paint job came out. Have you done any custom painting or super detailing of your locomotives and rolling stock? If so, tell me about your experiences down in the comments below. As I said a moment ago, I'll be bringing you another video soon about how I weathered this locomotive and get it ready for service on my layout. Well, if you enjoyed this video, here's a link to some more videos I know you'll enjoy as well. I hope you'll give it a thumbs up down below, and feel free to share it online wherever model railroaders hang out. I hope you'll check out the description down below this video, where you'll find links to my Amazon page, my Amazon Pick of the Week, my Patreon page, and ways that you can connect with me on social media. Join me again next Tuesday when I'll be bringing you another great Model Railroad segment, and I look forward to seeing you then. Ten, Lizzie?